Hello, our amazing listeners of Neuro Careers doing the impossible. It's your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K. And I'm excited to welcome you to the second season of our podcast, Exploring Entrepreneurial Careers in Neuroscience and Neurotechnologies. Have you ever wondered what it takes to transform brain science into groundbreaking products and services? Are you curious about the fearless visionaries who bridge the gap between neuroscience and entrepreneurship to change people's lives and reshape our world? Are you ready to explore how to navigate the uncharted waters of neurotech entrepreneurship? In season two, we're diving deep into the world of entrepreneurial ventures in neuroscience and neurotechnologies. If you are looking to create an immediate impact and translate your neuroscience and neurotech ideas into innovative services that truly make a difference in the world, this season is tailor-made for you. Join us and learn from the best in the field about succeeding in the entrepreneurial journey in neuroscience and neurotechnology where innovation meets impact. We've got an incredible lineup of guests who have not only shaped their careers, but have also made a profound impact on the field. Throughout this season, we'll explore the captivating stories of visionaries who've risen to the challenge, who've turned obstacles into opportunities, and who've innovated in ways that are changing the landscape of neuro careers. So, whether you are a seasoned professional in the field, an inspiring entrepreneur, or simply curious about the intersection of science and business in this ever-evolving arena, the season promises inspiration, education, and a glimpse into the exciting future of neuro careers. I am Dr. Milena Krastenska, the founder of the Institute of Neuro Approaches, where I help people establish successful careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies through career coaching and education. So let's dive into the entrepreneurial journeys that are shaping the future of neuroscience and neurotechnologies together. Tune in now into the thrilling episode number 71. Welcome, dear listeners, to another exciting episode of Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast. Today, we have the pleasure of introducing you to a remarkable guest whose work spans the realms of medicine, neuroscience, and innovation. Meet Dr. Jose Morales, a co-founder of Vanova and an accomplished neurointerventional surgeon with a passion for pushing the boundaries of what's possible in the field. With a background in translational neuroscience and a keen interest in molecular scale research, Dr. Morales brings a unique perspective to the world of neurointervention. As an interventional neurologist, he is on a mission to advance diagnostic and therapeutic approaches for various neurological conditions, all while minimizing the invasiveness of traditional neurosurgery. Dr. Morales is not only a pioneer in the generation of neuroendovascular theranostics, but he is also being recognized for his groundbreaking work. His achievements include winning the MedTech Color Pitch, being a finalist of the CLSA JNJ Quick Fire Challenge for Diverse Innovators, and participating in the UCLA Biodesign Accelerator Program, among other accolades. His latest venture, Vanova, is focused on developing minimally invasive brain interfaces to revolutionize the treatment of drug-resistant epilepsy and other neurological disorders. Through catheter-based technology, Vanova aims to provide less invasive and more effective solutions for patients in need. In this episode, we will dive deep into Dr. Morales' incredible career journey, exploring his career as a neurointerventional 
female surgeon, his passion for neuroscience, and the innovative work happening at Vanova. We'll also touch upon the challenges and opportunities in the field, shedding light on the exciting intersection of medicine and technology. Welcome, Dr. Morales. It's a great pleasure to have you today on our podcast. Can you please tell our listeners where you are joining us from, from what part of the world? Well, that was a really detailed introduction. Um, I guess all I can do is try to fill in some of those details. I've had what some would call a circuitous route into my career now. Um, nothing was ever sort of destined. Everything kind of came almost by sort of a little bit of planning and a lot of luck. Um, and some of it just sort of coincided with uh, changes in medicine and markets that have, I think, just provided some outstanding opportunities that are, you know, sort of what we all aim for in life. Um, I started my undergraduate training at uh, University of Central Florida. And my first degree was in liberal studies, and I studied English writing. And our, ended up working in a startup uh, that did rental cars, and uh, I was the operations manager there. And I had, a, you know, sort of a moment, I think, when I felt like this is not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so I started to consider long and hard what sort of careers seemed enticing to me. My first job was at a pharmacy and a lot of the pharmacists who worked the night shift were young guys who were very relatable, fun. We would have breakfast in the morning and they would often encourage me to think about a career as a pharmacist. And so I had a moment where I just kind of thought back on that suggestion and started to look into a career in the health sciences, I guess you could say broadly, and particularly pharmacy. Every week we would round with the medicine team and I kind of got a taste for what clinical medicine was like. So after I left my job, I ended up doing a observership or volunteership at the hospital, working with the pharmacists and uh, had every intention of going to pharmacy school at that point. I had done a couple of semesters and like I said, rounding with the medicine team, I think was for me the most enjoyable part of that experience. And it made me kind of question whether or not I really wanted to be a pharmacist or whether uh, that was just sort of the clue or the, the sort of the push or nudge I needed into, you know, sort of opening up my horizons a little bit more. So I kind of decided at that point I would switch. I was doing well in my undergrad. I, I re-enrolled to basically take all the science courses that you need to be able to make the requisites for medical school. and. Um, started volunteering in a lab, uh, Dr. Kimino Busugaya. He had a really large lab, well-funded, was working on human neural stem cells. And at the time, this was 2005, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm and curiosity about the potential of neural stem cells and how it was going to revolutionize clinical medicine. And uh, I just thought it sounded, you know, fascinating. And I uh, got into molecular cloning work there, so culture and transfection and really just started to fall in love with neurons. I mean, I felt like I had a really strong grasp on biology, molecular biology, genetics, and biochemistry, but neurons were that extra, you know, sort of the meta of cells, in addition to sort of transcribing proteins and RNAs to function, they also, you know, communicate across, you know, sort of big areas, inside the brain um, through these neurotransmitters and propagate these action potentials that give us our emergent behavior right now, right? Our ability to construct the software, have a discussion on a high level about um, complicated topics. In my mind, there was no doubt that uh, the brain was sort of the apex of evolution at this point. And I've always been drawn to the idea of kind of wrapping my head around complex topics. And that's that's kind of, I think, what motivated me to pursue further training in neuroscience. So as I was nearing graduation, I, I felt like I wanted to dive a little deeper into neuroscience without necessarily committing to a career in research. 
I knew I wanted to do clinical medicine at some point. So I started looking for master's programs in neuroscience and there weren't many in the United States. And I wanted to go to a program that obviously was impactful, was doing good work. And a lot of those just had PhD programs. So I started looking abroad and uh, got into Imperial College London under a student opportunities award, uh, which was a scholarship that helped make it a little bit more affordable for me. And um, that course was organized into sort of like the basic neurosciences and then segued into clinical neurosciences and tried to bridge it all together. Um, it was an integrative neuroscience degree. And uh, my mentor for the latter half of the degree was Richard Wise. He's a very charismatic neurologist. He's since passed. Um, but uh, he was one of the pioneers of functional magnetic resonance imaging and cognitive neuroscience. And I just got really fascinated with the brain and sort of studying the functions of the brain at that level. Um, there's just something a little bit more tangible about it. And I, I started to think about, you know, how I could integrate this into my career. I wasn't quite sure how I was going to pursue neuroscience and medicine. And as you know, you know, there's a variety of pathways. You've got neuroradiology, neurology, and neurosurgery. And I think a lot of people initially sort of, you know, think, oh, well, nursery sounds cool. <laughs> um, but uh, I think Richard Wise is one of those characters who really, through his charisma and his warm nature, he was just very inviting and just really they resonated with me. And, and I just felt like he had such a wealth of knowledge that it really drew me to neurology. When I finished that degree, I had to come back to the United States and you know, take the MCAT and apply to medical school, interview at medical school. So that was gonna take some time. So I ended up taking my next job at uh, Children's Hospital Boston, which is one of the Harvard Medical School affiliates under a mentor, Chin Fei Chen, and she was doing electrophysiology research. And um, you know, it was, wasn't a topic that I was initially aiming for. I, I wanted to continue functional magnetic resonance imaging research. And one of my classmates had actually come to Boston and was working at MGH at the Martino Center doing functional magnetic resonance imaging. And I felt a little jealous of him, you know, being able to kind of continue that work, which I thought was just excellent work, you know, just being able to understand, you know, the brain at the level of sort of cognitive operations and behavioral outputs. But I think it was sort of like a blessing in disguise that there weren't any opportunities for me at that time in functional magnetic resonance imaging research. So I, I started to, you know, sort of appreciate the opportunity having been in a lab before that was focused almost purely on molecular mechanisms of the neuronal differentiation and function to going to studying at a very macroscopic scale, um, how neurons organize behaviors across neuroanatomy to affect behaviors and cognitive functions. And now, you know, learning about more cellular based electrophysiological um, activity and how it's formed by experience um, through birth and these critical periods of plasticity. Um, and I think it really broadened my mind a little bit and it, and it kind of gave me a little bit of a chip on my shoulder when it came to fMRI research. Um, a lot of the criticisms I heard then were the fMRI is metastatistics and metastatistics are not real. <laughs> you know, you kind of, I think as you navigate through this journey, you're going to be influenced by things that are untrue way off <laughs> and maybe, you know, just partially true. <laughs> and I think even if you don't buy into everything that's told to you, you, you know, it could influence you and it's okay to be influenced by that. I think that that's how we evolve individually is sort of like, that's how we get the variation, right? This, you could think of ourselves as going through all these permutations of experiences and what are those inputs and how do people react to them? And I think that that's just part of life. We just sort of take these spontaneous moments and these sort of incomplete knowledge states and make the next leap. And, and then that builds into some of the inertia or momentum that we have at the time. And, and, and it continues to sort of snowball that way. I would say that one of the things that was surprising to me, or at least kind of made me want to rethink about what sort of career I wanted in medicine was in the UK, Richard Weiss was an academic, but 
he would have clinic and I think they didn't have as much subspecialization. And so they would see a, a wider variety of neurologic disorders and conditions. And that seemed to me just really fascinating to be able to go through the history and the physical exam and to be able to piece it all together and come up with this diagnosis out of many. And then I would say my experience in the United States was going into a clinic where we were seeing the same type of patients <laughs> over and over and over again, because everybody's so subspecialized. And that experience made me want to take a step back and think about, well, what sort of other clinical neuroscience you know, specialties are there and, and where can I find my place? I wasn't interested in just sort of seeing one type of patient or doing one kind of thing. Um, you know, what drew me to neuroscience to begin with, as I stated earlier, was was this idea of just sort of wrapping my head around this this large, complex process. And to go from that to just sort of seeing one type of diagnosis and offering very, very specialized care seemed a little bit I don't know, counterproductive to the uh, aspiration. So, but I, you know, went into medical school at the University of Chicago. I was very lucky. My wife and I were both applying to graduate school and it was the only graduate school we both got into. And so just kind of a lucky circumstance, I guess. And that's, you know, where I kind of started to think about my clinical career a little bit more seriously and, and try to kind of pin it down very early on, I was kind of interested in interventional radiology. It just seemed like a, a very unique field, you know, minimally invasive catheter-based treatments um, to sort of treat pathologies of the brain. But at that time, I would say that there was still a lot of controversy. Oiling, although it was being performed a lot in some places and other places, was still considered sort of an incomplete measure. And the truest treatment for an aneurysm would be surgical clipping. Coiling at that time in many places was considered something you would do for the unclippable neurism or, or the person who's too sick to undergo uh, neurosurgery. And times just changed throughout that period, you know? So in medical school, it was an entertaining specialty to consider, but everybody kept on telling me that there's just not a lot of cases, you know, um, no one's going to have a job when they finish it's saturated. And that was around the time when there were papers coming out um, calling for a halt in all training programs where they felt that they had completely saturated the field. And so I kind of dug my head down and started digging more into neurology. But I knew that I, I really enjoyed surgical specialties. I, I enjoyed the camaraderie. I enjoyed the interaction that you would have throughout the day with your attending physicians and your co-residents. There was something a little bit more teamwork oriented in a way, and I wouldn't, not to disparage any of the clinical specialties, but oftentimes, you know, when you're sort of doing clinical work, a lot of it's sort of like you get your list of patients, you work on that list and you work on your orders and you work on your notes. And, and I think in surgical specialties, you don't get away with that as much. You know, you take ownership over the whole service, everybody's responsible. And so everybody kind of tries to collaborate for that. I always said that if I wasn't so in love with neuroscience at the time, I probably would have just become a general surgeon. But I wasn't sure I had my first son already. This is my you know third year of medical school. My wife and I had two kids total. And uh, at that time, my firstborn was just coming into this world. And you know that was definitely an event that impacted and shaped me and what sort of choices I wanted to make. I was entertaining neurosurgery but everybody would tell me, where do you hide a hundred dollar bill from a neurosurgeon? You tape it onto his kid's head. You hear these sort of remarks and jokes and, you know, I wanted to explore it for myself. I didn't want to take anybody's word for it. And I started to do sub internships at my home institution. I, I did one at um, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville and one at the University of Michigan and really got to meet a lot of great people who have continued to grow their career and are, you know, becoming leaders now. And it really sort of helped shape, you know, my perspective a little bit on clinical care, as well as the things that I gravitated towards. You know, one of the first cases I saw at the University of Michigan was surgical resection of a spinal arteriovenous malformation that was causing somebody to have progressive weakness and had been misdiagnosed for some time. And honestly, even as a medical student, it was probably the first time I ever heard of that diagnosis. I never even knew it existed. That was something that's been relevant to my career at the present state. 
but seeing those people then and, and understanding that pathology more then really did help me make more informed choices later. When I went to Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, that was the first time I ever witnessed the effects of a thrombectomy. This was when it was still pretty off label. And uh, I saw a gentleman who'd come in with right hemiplegia and aphasia. And as soon as they took the clot out, he started speaking and raising his right arm again. And I just was floored. I thought it was such an impressive feat. But again, I'd say like, as you know, I went through that experience, you know, I took things away that certainly left indelible impressions on me, but also helped me sophisticate my own choices, right? They weren't just sort of easy choices. And when I was interviewing for neurosurgery, that was one of the things that kept on coming up where I was being challenged on my commitment to being a neurosurgeon above everything else and above spending time with my family and, and being a part of my son's life. And my wife also made me question, you know, like, well, if you go into this field, what's that say? You know, if that's what you're being told at these interviews and, and you decide to do it anyways, you know, what does that say about your values? And I've never heard anybody on their deathbed said that they wish they spent more time in their career. So I think that that really was a reflection for me about, well, how do I balance this? How do I balance um, my desire to intervene in cases where I think I make I could make a big difference in somebody's life long term and also not necessarily totally give up family life and everything else. And so around that time, the stroke trials were being announced as positive. This was uh, Mr. Clean trials back in 2015. And they really started to shake up the field. People were already starting to speculate what a demand there was going to be for neurointerventionalists. And um, one of the attendings there, uh, Wilson Cueva, he's now a, a neurointerventionalist in South Florida. I remember he was about to go train at Emory under Raul Nogueria, who's now one of uh, the thought leaders in our field. And he was saying, it, this is going to take off now. So if you want to do this, this is the time. That was sort of part of the impetus. And I remember early on during that time when I was trying to finalize my match list, which, you know, I interviewed for both neurosurgery and neurology. And you basically have to come up with a list of programs that you want to go to by specialty and, you know, the university. I remember looking and starting to having ideas about, well, uh, this if I'm going to go into this field, like how am I going to fit it into my neurophysiology research? And I started ideating around this concept. You know, I had done so much research on cognitive neuroscience and functional networks of connectivity in the brain and really had felt like I learned a lot about brain function at the cellular level all the way through this sort of like emergent behavior level. And that started to make me think about, well, has anybody ever thought about putting a stent inside the brain with electrodes? And this is, I guess, like another part of the advice that I would give to anybody is, you know, just because somebody else thought about it doesn't necessarily mean that you should be discouraged. If anything, it, you know, it's like an encouraging thing to think of something on your own and find that somebody has had that idea, it's funded that idea and is pursuing that idea. And, and so I started searching online and that's when the first paper by Tom Oxley, who's the founder of Synchron Stentro, had come out in nature and talking about uh, minimally invasive catheter implantation of a stent electrode. And it floored me. I was like, wow, is that the, I was thinking, <laughs> you know, I was like, this is gonna, this is gonna shape together. You know, that's how I thought about it. I said, this is, this is gonna come together for me. And I started to already imagine how that would work out. And I remember emailing him, I think even back then, and he was very generous and he replied and he said, I, I hope we get the opportunity to work together in the future. And I was just, you know, just a medical grad, <laughs> but I, you know, I was excited about it. And I, and I thought it was, had a lot of potential before I even engaged in that. I did some brain machine interface research at um, a lab at the University of Chicago and brain, uh, with Nicholas Atopoulos, who was one of the founders of BrainGate. And that really kind of helped me tie in that technology to the science that's behind it. And I think that my understanding of the science behind it had really helped me dive deeper into, you know, well, so what are the limitations and, you know, what are the things to consider? And 
And I thought it was a very elegant solution. I mean, there's certainly very different signal processing analysis that you would perform for, you know, say local field potentials versus spiking neurons. And, um, and I knew that that would sort of influence the decoding capabilities for behavioral outputs and digital motor outputs. But that was me thinking through all those experiences and helped me sort of continue to build on them in a way. And I think as you go through your career in neuroscience, whatever you're choosing, you know, you have to look at signals, external signals, because there's some people who say just like, you know, put your nose to the ground and just pump it out, you know, but I don't think that's necessarily the right approach. I think, you know, you have to be aware of where things are going and you have to understand things on a broader spectrum. And I just had a really neat experience understanding so many aspects of clinical neuroscience and even basic neuroscience. And these were all experiences that I didn't necessarily all plan precisely, but I knew I wanted to do some sort of clinical scientist role. And I knew that I wanted to get involved in brain research. That's something that a lot of medical students I knew were not interested in. You know, for them, they saw the clinical neurosciences as just, you know, working with a black box. And I think what motivated me about it was that it was still a black box, you know? I mean, cardiology, I feel like there's been so much that's sussed out. It's hard to really make a mark there. I mean, I will say that during that time in medical school, cardiology was also really ramping up, you know, with its catheter-based interventions. And I remember TAVR becoming more and more of a thing and, you know, going from just sort of like this humanitarian exemption use to like going into more regular practice. And so I saw those signals, but I, I, I couldn't stop thinking about neuroscience. And so when I was thinking about the stroke trials and the centrode, I just kept on thinking about how cardiology had already achieved all these things, had made this leap from to sort of cardiovascular disease all the way to structural heart disease. And I started already thinking about how we were going to make that leap. And one of my mentors there at UChicago was a functional neurosurgeon. And he would tell me all the time, like, well, at the end of the day, all of this is going to be interventional neurology in the future. You know, that, I think that resonated with me. And I carried that with me until I, I, when I made the choice to become a neurologist, there was a few things that just sort of worked in my favor at that time. You know, somebody who'd come up with really neat and sort of compelling new technology um, was a neurologist by background, Tom Oxley, and was now doing their intervention and the stroke trials and just also seeing a patient get better on the table. I mean, that just really impacted me in, in, in an immeasurable way. And so I already started trying to find ways that I can marry my love for neurophysiology and, and computational and cognitive neuroscience with a clinical career and, and was trying to think about all the use case scenarios for the stench road. And when I became a resident at Northwestern, I would constantly, you know, badger all the epileptologists about, you know, well, what do you think about the stench road? What do you think we could do for this? And, and they would give me all the criticisms. Oh, no, no, no. With epilepsy, you need to map the epileptogenic zone. You know, you got to be on the cortex. You can't be away, you know, like, you, you you could maybe detect the seizure with that, but, you know, what's the signal resolution? And they started, you know, picking it apart in a way that it's not my technology. So it's not like I had skin in the game per se, but that then sort of motivated me to start thinking about, well, how would we solve that? You know, how could we make this less invasive? Um, I, you know, I'd seen what people consider minimally invasive neurosurgery these days. It's stereo EEG placements and deep brain stimulation. But these techniques are techniques that were first developed in the Stone Age, you know, trepanation, cutting holes in the skull. And it's, it's, it's gotten a little bit more sophisticated than that, but the basic principles are the same. And I think that looking at the way cardio had evolved over time, you know, from doing open chest surgery to now doing almost everything through catheters. You can just see that trend of use, you know, there was uh, a time when people with arrhythmias, you know, had to be really, really sick, really unstable, very refractory to medications to undergo open chest surgery for atrial mapping and ablation. And when the catheter-based alternatives came out, I mean, the uptake skyrocketed. 
And I can resonate with that. I, I remember as a medical student, seeing some people who had had surgeries before and then doing another surgery and seeing all the adhesions that form all the scar tissue that forms from just the track of incising the skin and the infection risk that sometimes came out in people who had sort of recurrent problems and seeing like, you know, the body doesn't like this. The body doesn't like to be invaded. And, you know, what can we do to make things better? Certainly the tools are, are evolving. We should think about applying the same principles that cardiology did to neuroscience. You know, it was during my time at Northwestern when I first came up with the concept for this, you know, minimally invasive access to the brain surface and thinking about, well, you know, what are some trends, vascular ways that people have explored in the past? And, and I had already done some rotations in neurointerventional surgery and had gained a little bit more understanding about the tools and equipment and the general principles of it. And, you know, started thinking, well, you know, this transvascular stuff is being used in peripheral uh, radiology and even in some cardiology. Why aren't we doing anything transvascular in the brain? And so this was around 2017 was when I started to think about, you know, these transvascular applications and all the peripheral interventions that were being performed that way. And thinking back to all the epileptologist criticisms and comments about the stentrode and its limited applicability in epilepsy. And, you know, I started to marry those ideas together and started to put my thoughts down to paper and tried to get the university to patent my solution. <laughs> And one of the things that I think anybody going through this and having to work with the universities, you'll notice a few common themes. You know, universities have a finite budget, so they can't patent everybody's idea that walks through the door. Um, they have to sort of vet it a little bit. And some of their standard vetting processes typically involve, you know, are you permanent faculty or you're just sort of visiting? What resources have you used? What funding do you have? And so if you don't check any of those boxes, they're kind of unlikely to want to, you know, take on the project. So that's kind of what happened with me. They, 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 they saw that I was a resident. So I wasn't really in a permanent position at Northwestern and I wasn't working with the PI and I hadn't worked in anybody's lab and used any of the resources. And so they gave me a letter of non-assert and, and that only came after I started exploring ways to patent it on my own. And I was very lucky. Um, I had ran into this Chicago patent hub that links you up with pro bono services from established law firms. And I had submitted, you know, a request for patenting once I saw that Northwestern wasn't so interested in patenting my idea. And uh, they want, they're like, well, you know, these law firms aren't going to work with you unless you have a letter. So that's how I, how I even came to know about letters of non assert and um, started to, you know, knock on those doors with the technology transfer office and, you know, get the uh, clearance from them to pursue this on my own. And and that's how I started this, this journey, essentially. And shortly after that, I remember meeting Tom Oxley at a conference and we were just chatting about his technology and his journey and kind of just hinted to him at that time that I had something that I was very interested in working on that I thought was going to be really huge. And he had encouraged me at that time to reach out to DARPA because he said, that's what he did. So I sent a cold email. I think he did a cold call. <laughs> it's it, the times have changed. Um, so I, I had to send a, an email and that went unanswered for a few months. And, and then I got in contact with the program officer there uh, doing neurointerfaces in the biotechnology office. And they took a keen interest in the idea and were basically telling me that at the time that they had already filled a very similar proposal with a lot of performers and that unless someone had dropped out or not met their milestones, that, that they wouldn't be able to fit me in. And, you know, that's something that I kind of started to learn as well as sort of the different programs for funding these ideas and, and the limitations of each. So DARPA will typically bring in a new program manager and that program manager will start to ideate around, you know, what's his background and his specialty or his domain of expertise. And then he'll come up with it. He thinks is the future in that field. And, you know, for them, bring it up to his director. And his director will say like, okay, well, that sounds kind of intriguing. Well, well let's, let's, uh, let's, let's have a DARPA day and bring all these people who are experts in this and have them pitch. 
um, and then we'll, we'll sort of select some final performers and hone this on and, and get final approval for this program. But it's it's very driven by the program officer and it's very per, uh, driven by their tenure. And getting a program manager, I mean, at the very beginning of his tenure is favorable because he's still ideating around, you know, which programs he wants to develop and fund. Um, getting somebody at the end of their tenure usually means I'm on my way out. I've already, you know, I'm not going to have another opportunity to to fund new ideas. And so then, you know, he encouraged me to look at other funding options. And and I started thinking about the NSF and the NIH. And, you know, at that time, I think my idea was so early and very much kind of like a development process. And so the advice that I got from a lot of people is like, NSF's more engineering friendly. So if you have like hardcore engineering in mind without necessarily a, a very straightforward clinical application or, you know, not like narrowed down, you should consider the NSF. And and I'd reached out to them and gotten a delayed email back from Henry Yan, who's one of the directors of the SBIR program. And, and you know, he encouraged me to apply and I did that um, completely blind. So you're writing a proposal for the first time, basically knowing that DARPA was, you know, kind of already going to be less likely to be able to fund me, just given the state of um, that program manager's tenure and, you know, the program that was very similar to what I was proposing already being developed and having performers, uh, you know, the different ideas, but the idea was neural interface. And so I had a start forming an LLC in order to get the DARPA thing. And also because I, not the DARPA, the NSF a proposal, and I was getting the patent going and I had to license the patent to a company. And so all of these sort of catalyzed me in a different direction. You know, I was a resident in neurology at the time, and this was way beyond my scope. I had two kids and a wife at home and the residency. And then having this idea like in the background and trying to make something of it. And that was really, for me at least, uh, the big part of motivation was was my children. And my father, you know, when he were young, he would always, you know, point at something on TV. He's like, oh, I've thought of that in the past. So he just never did anything about it. And, um, and I was like, well, well, do I want to be that dad? And look back in 30 years and be like, yeah, I thought of that. I just never did it, you know? I've heard people say things like that before. Like, oh, I thought about coiling aneurysms back in the 60s. I just never put a patent out there. There has been a lot of embodiments of intravascular recordings. And there's been embodiments of stent-based recordings. But, you know, Tom Oxley took it. You know, he he went for it. And, and certainly that was an inspiration for me as well, to seeing somebody who's like done it and then myself being in my place and thinking about what motivated me to get into this field. And it was that I thought that there was going to be these avenues for new direction and exploration and innovation and really to impact patient care on a level that was going to leave a longer lasting impact, right? Beyond just sort of um, the day to day. And so it was thinking about that and, and leaving my kids with that example. I think any parent will feel that the one thing they want for their kids is to, you know, reach for the stars and and to seize the world. There's not a parent I know that doesn't feel that way. I mean, we all want them to be happy too, and but we also want them to just feel very emboldened to choose their own direction and their future and not be trapped by the necessities of life or because of a uh, lack of self-confidence. And and so I thought that that's how I saw it, you know, and I and I really meant it, you know. I wasn't just saying it to say it. It, it really impacted me at my core and comes back to what your values were, right? I had to make that choice about being a neurosurgeon or trying to pursue this field through neurology. And I chose my family and meant that much to me. So I, I think that that's why I kept going, even though I was so stretched thin at the time. And I had gone into fellowship at UCLA for neurointerventional surgery or interventional neurology. The field goes by a lot of different names these days. To gotten the attention of DARPA at that time, and it was still sort of unclear where that was going to go and had spoken with Tom Oxley on the phone and he had told me, you know, you're going to need a team. If you're going to go do fellowship there, you should build a team. And, you know, I just mentioned these names just because, you know, these are like a lot of names that people will recognize or maybe be familiar with depending on 
whatever field or, or branch of neuroscience you're, you're they're pursuing. But it's important, I think, just so that you know that oftentimes, even though these people seem like they're much further along than you are or way ahead, that they're not all sort of intangible. You know, these are real people. And, and if you can get them to relate to you on a, on a certain level, or, or you have the the forum for that, right? I think that meeting them at a conference really helped. That's something you should carry with you. You know, don't be afraid. You know, there's going to be people out there that inspire you or people that have done things that are like what you've done or things that you really feel are going to push your field forward. And, you know, you're not, not everybody's going to be responsive. I mean, I certainly dealt with my list of people who never replied to an email, but all career advice comes down to this is be persistent, be thick skinned, know what you want. And when you have an opportunity, grab it. When I had people reply, then I, I took that opportunity and I made those people regular contacts if I could. I tried to break down that barrier. And the people who stood out to me were honestly the people who were the most approachable, the most down to earth, the most relatable, the most welcoming. I could name so many names throughout my whole career of people that have really just impressed me that way. Even in you know medical school, through residency and fellowships, I felt like the people who were the most aspirational to me were the people who made me feel like I was their buddy and, you know, they were just going to figure out what I wanted and how they could help me. And there wasn't all this hierarchy and there wasn't this ego for me, at least personally, very motivating. And I would say that that first encounter really came with Richard Wise. Richard Wise was like the first mentor I ever had that wanted to go grab a drink at the bar, would come out on on a Friday night social hour, he would have lunch with us every day. There was no separation between him and you know his minions per se. I think that that was certainly a leadership style that I think I've tried to adopt. I've, I've learned either the hard way sometimes that trying to pull rank on people or trying to puff up your chest really gives you good results. And even if it gives you results, it doesn't leave people with a good impression. And I think back to the people who had opportunities to be mentors for me, you know, who kept me at such an arm's length and didn't really take me under their wing. Those are people that perhaps in the future would say like, oh, that kid came up with that. I remember him, you know, like, oh, I, why didn't he come to me with that? Those are the experiences that I had, right? And so those are the experiences you're going to have too. You're going to meet people that either kind of kept you at an arm's distance and, and you have to just keep going from there. You can't just wait around for their approval or for their acceptance you've got to continue to sort of push your own way and, and find the people who are going to enable you. And the people who enable you are ultimately going to be people that you recognize as, as positive influences uh, throughout your career. And so this journey for me at least started just from wanting to pursue something a little bit more meaningful than what I was doing. And that was just being an entrepreneur in a, the rental car industry. And that led into this huge journey of neuroscience and um, neurology, neurosurgery, and ultimately into interventional neurology or neurointerventional surgery, however you want to call it. Um, I felt like I've just been in an amazing time. And I remember reading Malcolm Gladwell's book on people who became thought leaders in their fields. And he, I remember him kind of contextualizing it as like a lot of it's builds around the time that you're born, the enabling technology and the early experiences that you have to kind of create the situation where you can really take that in and run away with it before anybody else catches up with you. Fingers crossed. I think that that's where we're headed with Vanova, where we're just sort of, I was born at the right time. I came into this field at the right time with the right sort of state of technology behind me and um, the right set of pipeline technology ahead of me to really reduce sort of a whole new paradigm for the brain. But that's our goal is to, you know, treat patients and give them just a better experience and not have this constant fear of, you know, what, what it's like to undergo neurosurgery, the invasiveness of it, the dangers of it. A lot of these techniques have been developed a long time ago. And although some have gotten better, they, they still rely on a lot of crude materials and sometimes they're really get things to move forward and to kickstart them, you know, you've got to just find a whole different route. I guess the last piece of, of what I would say in terms of innovation is there's a lot of people nowadays who call themselves innovators and they're really just iterators. And that's unfortunately what's rewarded in the entrepreneurial space. 
by investors and even incubators. You have a proven market, you have a proven reimbursement pathway, you have a proven sort of indication and you have volume numbers, you have, you know, everything is laid out, right? All you have to do is have an idea that's patentable and have freedom to operate. You know, if it has a 10% improvement over the last device and you can meet the freedom to operate and patentability clause, most people would jump on board, especially if it's a class two device, meaning it's not a permanent implant. Um, class two devices, you can get under this pathway called 510K. And that just means that it has substantial equivalence to a device that came before you uh, with similar specifications and performance. And that basically allows the FDA just to review your building materials and your biocompatibility test and, and say so you, meet, you meet the criteria. And for investors, that means a shorter time for a return on investment. And uh, going through all of this, I always kind of have to put it back in perspective. I always been that kind of person, you, you go big or you go home. And so that's how I felt about going for medicine. That's how I felt about going for neuroscience. And that's how I felt about going for neurointerventional surgery. I was never at any point thinking, I'm just gonna be complacent and take this small bite. And so for me, what's really shocking and what's really off-putting, I would say, is, is all these people who say that they invest for the transformation of the healthcare, but then now they want to invest in iterative improvement on existing technology. And I think, unfortunately, we're in a bad market. Um, and so it, it's definitely made people have to be a little bit more conservative with their investments. But you have to really applaud those investors who are into impact investing and those sort of mission-driven foundation uh, family offices that they want to do an impact. They want to make an impact. And those are the people that do take some bad bets, that when they make good bets, I bet you for them, it's much more fulfilling. There's going to be a million catheters that suck clots out and millions of iterations on it, but no one's going to remember the name of the person who invented it or, you know, how much better it was when there's something even better coming out ahead of it. You know, when you really try to form a new trajectory in the field, I think it's just a great opportunity and a great opportunity to feel like you're part of the building blocks or something. And, you know, you're, you're setting up the pillars and that's still what motivates me. And that's still what I'm, uh, drives me every day. You know, I'm still busy. I still got two kids, a family, I've got a startup, I've got full-time clinical practice, you know, but I'm writing proposals. I'm trying to meet with mentors and gather resources and meet with investors. And this is just sort of, where we're at, that's the state that we're at. And, you know, I always like to tell people that there's going to be a, a time when people will say, what are you going to spend your time on and do what you like and just follow, you know, your heart and life work balance. And, and a lot of people look at what I've done and, and say like, wow, you really have no life work balance. And, but I, I don't feel that way personally. You know, I feel that I love what I do clinically. It's just an amazing feeling to be able to like make a big difference in somebody's life. And I love what we're doing at Vanova. I think it's really going to transform the field of neurointervention and even neurosurgery in that regard. And I love that my family. And so none of these are, are just work, you know, nothing is just sort of just a task that I have to tick off. These are all valuable things and I'm, and me spending as much time as I can in each of them really, I think is just how I gain my fulfillment. You know, I don't want to watch a soccer game and drink beer. You know, I do occasionally, but not all the time. And it's not just something that I want to dedicate a lot of bandwidth to. And, and so, you know, you'll make those choices in your life, whatever it is that you feel motivates you and stimulates you is what you should do. And for some people it is sports and for some people it is seeing movies and and I enjoy all those things as well, but I just probably dedicate less time to them than some people. And I dedicate more time to some of these other things than other people. But the last thing that I kind of want to leave everybody with, it's just, you know, I came from a household that was born in one of the poorest regions in Puerto Rico. And my dad went to college, but he never finished. And, you know, he just wanted us to go to college and, and be college grads. And I never really had a lot of direction in terms of career from my immediate family. Um, we didn't have any lawyers or doctors in our family. And so I went to each of these things, not really knowing whether I had the potential, whether it was there for me or not. And 
those are big risks that I took because I believed in myself and I put myself to the test too, right? Like there's, I think there's that realism that we have to have. You know, when I went back to school, I was kind of very scared at first. I was like, it was my first biology class. What if I can get an F, you know, um, I'm, I, I'll sink myself. And I was very nervous at first going back to school at, at the age of 25 and tried to wrap my head around, you know, organic chemistry and all these things. I ended up becoming one of the top five students in that class. And I enjoyed it, you know, but it wasn't like, it, that was the encouragement that I got, right? But it was also, you know, being real, right? And uh, that said, you know, I had classmates who didn't do well in organic chemistry and still found their way into medicine. So there's, you know, the resilience that you have to have and the resourcefulness that you have to have to sort of carve your way into whatever it is that you aspire to be. I mean, there are ways, there's no straightforward path and there's no definite block to it. I mean, the world has gotten a lot more creative and as you know, the internet has become even more accessible and ability to access and, and generate information has become even more sophisticated. We are able to really have so much more at our fingertips and, and guidance and, and a path forward and anything that we want to do. I think it's just worth keeping an open mind, but also putting yourself to the test. And you know, you're always going to find things that you think you might like, but then you don't like. And then, and being honest with yourself. And I, this is advice that I give to everybody now. I would say I haven't always been honest with myself. There are times when I said I wanted this. And when I got closer to it, I realized I didn't want it. And it's kind of stuck with what I ended up thinking was the right choice. A great example of that is when I was thinking about going into medical school, I applied to MD PhD programs. And that's because I was at Harvard and everybody there was like the PhD and and it, it seemed like such a great path, you know, and there was this sort of chip on everybody's shoulder, like we do science, we don't do clinical work or research. <laughs> And so I, I, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be a scientist, you know, but I, I really tried to fit into that. And the whole time, I think in, inside, I had this apprehension, do you really wanna do that? Do you really wanna breed mice and inject them with like viral vectors and cut off their heads and look them under microscopes? And, and I, I really suppressed that for a long time. You know, I, like I said, I applied for all these MD PhD programs. I got into an MD PhD program in New York and it wasn't until I really had to come to that choice that I I felt like, you know what, I don't really want to be an MD PhD. And so that's where I think I made a choice that was true to myself and sort of ex a good example of how we can lead ourselves on a little bit longer than we should. And I still love science, right? I still felt like, but I just didn't want to go off and do a PhD for six years in the middle of medical school. You know, there's some people who do, maybe there's a lot of people who don't, but they still do it anyways. And I think there's a pretty high attrition right there. And so, you know, when you're thinking about your career and what you want to do, I, you know, you just got to be really honest with yourself and listen to that little voice inside your gut about, is this really what you want? And you know, how much do you really want to do that? There's a lot, easy to romanticize a lot of things. A friend of mine told me, no matter what you find yourself in, you know, you're gonna, there's gonna be 20% of that work, as much as you think you're gonna love everything about it, there's gonna be 20% of that work that you don't enjoy. But if, you know, you can have 80% of it that you do enjoy, then you've picked the right thing. And so you know, a lot of people will tell you, follow your passions, but without sort of that real leveling, and I, and I, I think that, that that real leveling is important to just sort of say, I'm going to choose this and 20% of that work I don't care for, but I'm going to do it anyways because I enjoy the other 80% of it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great advice and example for our listeners. Um, we have a little bit more time left, and I would like to explore this topic of interventional neuroradiology to better understand your product and, in general, this new minimally invasive approach to uh, surgeries and as well brain computer interfaces. So you mentioned this very interesting development in the field uh, from the time when uh, very invasive approaches were used to then uh, that 
pause in the field uh, when things started to change and then explosion of already new approaches where you came in uh, at, at the right time, at the right place, yes? So can you uh, explain this development to our listeners? Because I'm sure not all of them and actually not many of them know what is the catheter, what is this approach to treating um, stroke patients? How did it differ uh, before and now? And also maybe some parallels with the heart, heart uh, uh, surgery uh, or treatment of different heart conditions that are also using those minimally invasive approaches. Do you think you can do it? Yeah, that's that's really good. So I'm a neurointerventional surgeon. I, I do a lot of these catheter-based approaches Catheters are long plastic tubes. They're hollow. They're tiny, usually a couple millimeters or less. And um, we use them to access the vessels of the brain or the heart. In many instances, me in my field, it's mostly just head and neck interventions and diagnostics. We also do some spine. And um, we essentially get this access. This was um, the field was first invented by a, a Portuguese neurologist, actually. Um, he was the first to show cerebral angiography was possible. He did it by directly injecting the carotid with a needle and then injecting contrast. And so that's how the field got started. And, you know, neurology played a big role throughout it. So there was this technique that's now used. So we, we look at x-rays and x-rays kind of guide our catheters. And so oftentimes our catheters or our devices will be what we call radiopaque, meaning they absorb x-rays to, to be visualized. And uh, the problem is, is that a lot of things that are radiopaque can sort of superimpose on each other and not enable you to see them. And it was actually a neurologist um, in Europe who had developed a way to subtract the background uh, radio opacity of an x-ray um, so you can remove the skull so that if you did the injection with the contrast and you would just see the contrast filling the artery without all the skull in the middle. That's just like a couple of historical examples. Um, and I would say jumping forward, you know, one of the first interventional neurologists in this country, the first half dozen or so, was working almost exclusively on ischemic applications. He was in a neurosurgery department and, and you know, they were all interested in aneurysms and arteriovenous malformations. And he had this long sort of goal of like trying to develop interventions, you know, to for people who had ischemic disease. And so carotid stenting was something that was well done a while back. And that involves this sort of a braided stent that comes down the neck artery. And the people, some people have tightening of the artery there and they can have strokes as, as a result of lack of blood flow across the tightening. But interventions inside the brain were not really well established. I did my fellowship at UCLA. And that was the program that kind of really pioneered a lot of these early interventions. They did um, the first detachable coils so, you know, people had had this idea of like, we can implant coils inside an aneurysm and an aneurysm is like a, basically like a balloon off the artery. It's like a hernia off the artery and put these coils in there and then detach them. Then maybe you can just block the, the aneurysm so it won't burst and cause a massive brain bleed. And um, then, so UCLA was part of that development early on and they also helped uh, sort of reduce the material onyx at clinical practice. A lot of those faculty were involved in that early work. That's a liquid uh, embolic agent that we use to treat malformations and fistulas. You basically take these small microcatheters that are put within larger catheters and you get way out into a part where this artery and vein abnormally communicate and you inject this little substance that blocks the flow between them and you can basically eliminate that abnormal connection. And then I think in the late 90s, one of the UCLA faculty had come up with a device to pull clots out, mechanical embolectomy, retrieval, something or the other. Uh, it was called the Mercy device. And it was the first device of its kind, but it wasn't apparently a very good device. So even though it was very transformative in terms of highlighting a new way, it was a device that was replaced by later iterations of better devices that could be used called stent retrievers. And these are basically stents that are left on a pusher wire. They get deployed from small catheters around the clot inside one of the arteries of the brain. And the idea is that these things kind of like integrate the clot within the struts of the stent. 
and uh, then using a catheter to pull that clot back in, kind of like a Chinese finger trap device, or just to suck the clot out. And that was something that was first being developed in 2003. So the first indication from the FDA to pursue mechanical thrombectomy wasn't until 2015. So you could imagine a company trying to push this field from 2003 of, you know, we can just suck clots out, you know, give us a chance to really 12 years later, um, you know, getting that validation. I'm sure it must have been very uh, rewarding for them. And that's, I think, a really interesting journey as well. I was just thinking about how the evolution of those devices had progressed, you know, from just being a device that was sort of highlighting a whole new way of doing things and then it falling short, but still providing enough of a signal for other people to move forward and iterate and, and innovate around that space and create better devices that could perform this more safely and more effectively. But yeah, that's sort of the work that I've done. I've that's sort of the state of our field right now is traditionally just more in a vascular disease space. So we treat a lot of these abnormal connections between arteries and veins. We also treat abnormal structures on the arteries, like aneurysms or dissections. And then um, we also treat some venous diseases, like uh, say like people have stenosis and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Um, so in the sinuses, and so we'll go to like the transverse sinus, and if there's a gradient across that narrowing that meets a certain threshold, we typically will put a stent across there or a balloon angioplasty it, and it'll open it up and it'll really help them with their symptoms. Other procedures that we've also been performing uh, more recently is blocking the arteries that feed uh, membranes that form when people have subdural hemorrhages. Subdural hemorrhages um, typically occur after trauma or a fall you can get this blood accumulation and that blood accumulation can cause the covering of the brain, the dura matter, to sort of create new blood vessels that are leaky and you sort of maintain this fluid collection in the subdural space. And someone had this idea like, well, what if I block those arteries? Would it finally give the body a chance to resorb all that fluid? And so that's currently undergoing clinical trial evaluation right now, but we're using it pretty widely anyways because there's been really good data from the clinical series. And as far as Vonova, you know, um, we're developing a, a technique to get into the subdural space of the brain using catheters. There's only so much I can disclose at this early time point, but we basically are creating a pathway that gets us right into the spaces that neurosurgeons typically have to cut through skin, bone, and the dura to get access to. You know, a lot of the things that are obvious about that, right? That they're invasive, that patients don't like being cut into, that the body doesn't like being cut into. I think the other advantages of it are that it's coming at a time when all of this sort of novel technology is in the pipeline with miniaturization and a fabrication. It really is going to give us an opportunity to exploit the diagnostic and therapeutic capabilities that are sort of emerging right now in a miniaturized fashion without subjecting people to big surgery. There's been a lot of interest in like sort of nanorobots and other things like that. I mean, at the end of the day, they're either going to be in the blood vessel or not. So developing a pathway out of the blood vessel directly into the space of the brain um, is certainly a very unique approach. And I think is just a, really a platform to do so much um, to understand neurologic disease, neuropsychiatric conditions, and treat them more effectively with a little bit more precision than what we do right now. Yeah, and that's a very interesting question. So we already have this fairly good access to uh, the vasculature space uh, of the brain. Uh, now, what is that uh, that helps us to make a transition from vascular recording to recording from the brain? How is this connected? Uh, how this can be done? Yeah, so I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier. So these transvascular techniques were first pioneered by Charles Dodder. He did the first transvenous biopsy, and it's shown that it was feasible to basically poke out of the vein and get right into the liver and to be able to collect tissue. And these techniques have been adapted and they're currently in use and practice. You know, the body's a little bit different because everything's so accessible, you know, um, whether you're going from a catheter or you're going directly through the skin. Um, but the brain, I think, is a little bit different um, as the heart was and has been. 
So our approach kind of borrows a little bit from that. And there's been others who've been working on this. There's an investigator out of the Karolinska Institute, and that technology has been spun off as SmartWise Extraducer. Um, there's another company, Cerevask Ishant. They also kind of poke their way out of the vessel to drain fluid from the cerebral spinal fluid, um, I mean, from the cerebellopontine angle to relieve hydrocephalus, as opposed to doing invasive neurosurgery where you have to like drill a hole and then put this shunt through with a cannula to drain the fluid and then have to tunnel that all the way into their belly. It's a very elegant solution that they've come up with. Um, there's another company that was recently awarded the NIH uh, MedTech Blueprint Grant uh, and the Vascular Horizons. They're also doing a transvascular approach to draining subdural hemorrhages. And so there's a lot of interest in the space and this is all evolving very quickly. The, I would say that the main differences between those technologies and what the stentrode is, the stentrode stays within the vasculature. So although it has its advantages of not irritating the brain or not, you know, it, those are also its disadvantages. The fact that it, it is kind of away from the brain means that it is still away from the brain. And so you don't have access to tissue, you don't have access to fluids, you don't have access to how that signal evolves across um, cytoarchitectonic boundaries of the brain, right? And we know that there's different functional zones within the brain and, and the evolution of sort of uh, activity as it goes from like, say, the premotor cortex and the motor cortex or the supplemental motor cortex. It's kind of important information that uh, can be lost, especially if you're trying to map a seizure and you're trying to make sure that you can take out this piece of tissue but not that one. I think a value proposition at Vonova is that a lot of times when people are undergoing epilepsy surgery, there's a big decision to be made about where to place these stereo EEG electrodes. And they use a lot of non-invasive imaging. And the way I've kind of heard it from one neurosurgeon is that all this non-invasive work for epilepsy is kind of like you, you get the section of the, of the stadium that way. But to know your row and seat number, you actually have to be on the brain. And so that's what Vonova does, I think, different than um, any other other company out there is we are able to get your, your the seats and, and, and row number with that level of precision. So not compromising uh, signal quality, um, spatial resolution that we typically give up when we do a lot of less invasive modalities. And so I think that that's where Vonova really stands out is, is having a little bit more versatile platform than any other thing out there that's currently working on a transvascular approach for the brain. We're specifically focused on bioelectronics, but uh, have a plan to, you know, continue to expand out there into other domains of clinical neuroscience and, you know, not compromise at any time in terms of efficacy and safety. Um, so I think patients have, will respond to that similar to the way they did for aneurysm coiling. You know, I stated earlier when that technique first came out, for the aneurysm that was unclippable because it just was in a bad location or the patient who was just too sick to go to neurosurgery or too frail. Now it's the majority of cases. I mean, if you look at a chart between the two, like there's open surgery here is endovascular surgery over time that they kind of totally reversed. Now everybody's getting endovascular. I think a lot of people kind of underestimate that because, you know, it's not you making that choice about going to surgery. I, uh, you know, I remember I had a procedure done for something minor, you know, but I had to get general anesthesia and I was scared. You know, I felt, okay, you know, like, uh, hopefully I don't have a bad reaction. <laughs> hopefully they intubate me well, you know, like as a doctor, right, I kind of know all these things. So I kind of know everywhere where things can go bad. So just imagine adding to that anxiety with saying like, okay, we're going to drill into your skull. We're going to put this electrode in there's a small chance we can cause a brain bleed that could be catastrophic. You know, like, oh, that's still a big... <laughs> and I'm not saying that Vanova obviates all of those um, risks, right? It just minimizes the access and, and ideally, I think, will reduce that risk. The risks always are present in medicine. You know, anytime you have to undergo a medical procedure, there's risk. Like I said, I was getting something very minor being done for my my teeth, you know? And I think... What if I get an infection? I get rheumatic heart disease. What if I get osteonecrosis? <laughs> you know, your head can go down that pathway. And I think that patients really do have a lot of anxiety about the invasiveness of procedures. But I think that part of what neuroendovascular or neurointerventional has been able to do as a field 
is offer these less invasive therapies that are just much more palatable. You know, patients are much more likely to consider, you know, oh, you're just going to go through like a little needle poke in my groin and you're going to be able to like take care of my aneurysm. It's gone forever after that. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that now. As opposed to like saying like, oh, we're just going to cut a small part of your bone out and we're just going to lift a little bit about your brain and then we're going to put a little clip there. You know, it's, um, you can tell me how effective it is over everything else, but it's really, um, I think ultimately patients just want the less invasive option, especially if you can give them decent results. There's still some people, old gods out there who want to keep promoting this idea that there's still a bunch of cases that are neurosurgical and, and the right thing to do. But the technology keeps on getting better with neurovascular. You know, neurointerventional has come up with devices that go within the aneurysm. We call them intracellular devices. We have these stents that redirect the flow around the aneurysm. It's called flow diverting stents. And they've really sort of continued to transform aneurysm care. You know, there is a less and less of that, well, there's this is not a good aneurysm for coiling. Well, maybe it's good for flow diversion. I mean, there's still probably some instances where you can say that there's an aneurysm that involves like I think a lot of branches and Maybe one of these branches might go to the area of the brain. And the only way to really get this aneurysm closed safely would be through clipping. And, you know, the, those are reasonable discussions to be had. And, and I think patients will ultimately respect the decision of the doctors if it's in their best interest. Outside of that, I think we owe it to people and to patients to provide a less invasive way without compromising safety and efficacy. And that's what I think is really what I focus in on is, as a mission is to just provide people with that through Bonova. I, I, and I really do think that we're on to something really important, really big, and it's really going to transform the fields. And I think I've alluded it to before, it's just, you know, seeing how seizure activity propagates and knowing exactly what's safe to take in surgery is information that you can only get from laying an array across those parts of the brain. The advantages of Bonova's Cerebral Atlas platform is that we get right onto the brain surface. And so we're able to essentially lay out a map of how this neuronal activity is evolving over time with the same spatial temporal resolution as an invasive electrocortogram or a stereoelectroencephalography. You know, being able to be in an area of interest really is going to uncover the true potential of like a neurointerventional method of getting the resolution that neurosurgeons are accustomed to getting. And that uh, sort of state of the art technology has been accustomed to getting. And I kind of go back to uh, the analogy with what first stent retriever. So, you know, UCLA came up with this mercy retriever, first of its kind, getting clots out of the brain someone could have said like, oh man, that's, that's it. That's the future. We just stopped there. But now the devices have gotten so much better. And now people are just sucking out clots without using stents that are scraping against the vessels. And people are saying like, now that's better, you know? <laughs> but I think that that's where I see Venova is, is, I think, having its own advantages over anything else that's out there, including, you know, companies like Precision Neuroscience. It has a I would say a sort of a similar concept of being able to get onto the brain surface with something that, that without big, big, big surgery, but they still require this, you know, drilling through the skull to get there. And, uh, you know, the scalp is a very dirty place. Uh, you know, there's a lot of bacteria that grows in our skin and having a direct communication between the surface of your brain and, and your scalp is never good. If you look at some of the literature on like, uh, pacemaker placement and um, implantable cardio defibrillator devices. Um, these are devices that typically go into the heart and then kind of tunnel subcutaneously into a subclavicular transponder, which kind of carries the batter and the programming for the device. Those versus something say like Neuropace. Neuropace is a device that basically replaces a portion of your skull with a prosthetic and that prosthetic has a battery and that battery basically operates your neurostimulation device and your neural sensing device. And, and you know, nerve pace works as, as a pacemaker for the brain almost. It, it'll sense when you're having a seizure and send a shock out to abort it. The infection rates between those two approaches are dramatically different. I would say anywhere from five to 10 times as much, you know, to be that close to the brain is always a big risk. And as a resident, and even when I was doing my sub eyes or sub internships uh, with different neurosurgical teams at different hospitals, it was like the bane of that service's existence was you know, all these infected shunts and meeting revisions and whatever. So, you know, I think that 
having that background in medicine has helped me certainly be able to really hone in on what I think are the limitations of certain technologies as well as the risk of certain technologies. And, in you know, it takes just a little bit of extrapolation. Um, not a lot of people do that. And when you do, people are kind of surprised. Like, oh, why would you equate that with that? And it's, well, it's not validated, but, you know, it's pretty intuitive. <laughs> and so um, that's where I think Vonova really fills a niche, you know, being able to keep the infection rates low that they have been able to do in cardiology, but not compromise on sort of the efficacy. Um, I think is really going to be the key. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, from what you uh, already mentioned, in uh, your case with Vanova, you are delivering the electrodes that are being positioned on the surface of the brain, actually through the vein. So uh, Seth, maybe you can uh, a little bit elaborate on it. Uh, it's about the chronic versus temporary implantation. Yeah. Yeah, so I think one of the advantages of going extravascularly is that you're able to get these signals readily because it's just like any other surface electrode on the brain. Um, there's no um, need to sort of wait for the signals to sort of stabilize or um, insulate themselves from the pulse artifact that might be present in the vessel. But, um, you know, that's kind of where I think there's real value in what we're doing. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Morales, for uh, this absolutely amazing interview. Can you maybe, as we're entering the end of our podcast, tell our listeners what was the biggest challenge in your career and how did you solve it? So what helped you to solve the biggest challenge in your career? Oh, that's tough. I think <laughs> it's a hard question to answer. I mean, there's certainly been a lot of challenges throughout this whole journey. I remember when I had a comeback from having a almost a B in calculus too to like kind of get excellent grades to make an A out of that class, you know, uh, that was a challenge. Um, another challenge was having to retake a test during my master's at Imperial College because I just came under the right score and and you have a chance to take the test again and pass it. And at the time it was devastating, you know. I was like, I can't believe it. It is such a different scoring measure in the UK. You know, you basically write these essays, you have to cite all these papers. In the US, it's all like multiple choice. <laughs> so it was like a very different experience for me. When I was a resident, I remember having some really difficult cases that were very challenging and, you know, kind of being in that role of taking care of so many people at once certainly left you vulnerable at times where, you know, you just couldn't do everything at once. And then, having something go wrong or something that, you know, if you had been less busy, you would have caught certainly does weigh on you and it's, you know, it impacts you a little bit. And, you know, to this day, I think my biggest challenge has always been being able to do everything well enough, right? Uh, being a father, being a husband, being uh, an entrepreneur, being a clinician, um, there's just very different skill sets and they all require a lot of investment with time and that continues to be a really big challenge to be able to do that effectively and not sort of leave one wanting. I think that's a very big challenge. So time management has always been a challenge. I think time management plays into a lot of things. You know, the person who can master their time is the person who can master the world. So I think learning ways or strategies to maximize your time for effectiveness is really the key. And I'm a big believer, actually, in zoning out and just letting, you know, your mind rest to kind of jump back in. That's been an approach that I've found for a lot of creative endeavors. So I, I play music and, you know, you could play a lick a million times and you can't find the next chord progression to get into a chorus. Um, and you can try and you can force it and you could, then you just aren't satisfied. And then if you come back to it a couple of days later, you might just, oh, that works really well. And so sometimes I think any sort of endeavors like that, where you just have to pause, collect yourself, let your mind relax, and then come back to the task when you're better adapted or ready, um, as opposed to just trying to force the issues. I think that that's also where we make a lot of mistakes is trying to fit things in on one timeline. And so, you know, there's sometimes say like in patient care, 
you might be thinking through a case and you're trying to like get it all right up front, but maybe you don't know everything yet, or maybe you, you still need to stop and think about it some more. And if you rush, then you end up doing the wrong thing. You know, even when it comes to like embolizing an artery for an arteriovenous malformation, right? If you don't stop and think about it, or you don't really, you can end up doing a lot of harm. So all of these things, I think that there's sort of mastering your time, but also taking time to reflect and to not necessarily rush everything just because you feel like you have no time. So it's kind of two paradoxical pieces of advice, I would say, like maybe counterintuitive that way. But I do think that, that those two have some synergy and knowing how to do that effectively is really important. Thank you so much. Uh, what is the best way for our listeners to learn about what you do and to connect with you? Yeah, so you guys can look up uh, Vonova.io. It's our website. If you're interested, you can subscribe to our, mail, uh, our newsletter. If um, you're interested in uh, learning more about careers in medicine or neurotechnology, certainly try to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Also know that there's a, I'm very busy. So if I don't get back to you immediately, it's not because I don't care. It's just, um, but yeah, feel free to subscribe to us at Vonova.io. We have a website with a, uh, a way for you to enter your information and so you can stay up to date with our progress. If you, you know, really need some guidance on uh, on thinking through a career path or you have ideas that you want to know how to better sort of uh, chart them or manifest them and to then realize them, I'm happy to connect. You know, I think it's a very daunting experience in doing things that are like outside of your wheelhouse. So being a clinician, trying to start a company and develop uh, intellectual property and start a business is very, very difficult. And I was very lucky to get to uh, recruit and uh, maintain a co-founder on Venova. He's the current CEO, Wesley Jones. He's an engineer with uh, experience in cardiac mapping and ablation devices. And so I think it's a lot of uh, very analogous to what we're trying to do for the brain. And he's joined me on this journey and he's certainly been one way to help me relieve this load. And, you know, we're talking about time and that was kind of like a, a, a sort of being me being realistic. At some point, you also have to realize you need, you need help and you need, you need colleagues that you can trust. And having Wesley take the realm as, as sort of the prime manager of the company, you know, was something that I just needed to do to be able to do everything. And I still am so involved, you know, in, in so many aspects of, of developing the technology, but to be sort of that administratively busy with the the operations of a business, I think would have been too big of a buy for me to take. So I think that that's very important too, is realizing when you need help and being able to reach out to the right collaborators and to partners and, you know, developing those, those relationships are very important. Yeah. Thank you. And by the way, the name Vanova, where is it coming from? I w was curious, wanted to ask. Yeah, so Vanova <laughs> is actually um, sort of a bit of an amalgam, I think, between two languages. I think one of them is Nordic and the other one, I forget from where, but it means new hope. And um, Vo Nova, so I think Nova is new and then Vo is like hope and like some sort of Scandinavian language. And uh, we picked it because we wanted to essentially signal to people what we were representing to them. That's something that for me was very important. Uh, my co-founder and I were trying to come up with names. Didn't The original name of the company was Juad, which was an amalgam of my two children's name. And investors and people hearing our pitch, just like, what does that stand for? I don't understand. I don't know what to say. So we had to like come up with a name that was a little bit, that rolled off the tongue a little bit easier, but still had meaning. And, you know, I think we both derive a lot of uh, sort of um, mission-driven motivation by thinking that, that we really are carrying like a whole new chapter for people. And that means hope. And so the new hope for patients impaired by neurologic disease who are afraid, are deathly afraid of undergoing invasive brain surgery and to have had complications from brain surgery. And they think that there's a lot of hope that we can offer if we continue to succeed. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, I wish you all possible success in all your endeavors. Uh, hope to see the new product, you know, in, in the next uh, coming 
a couple of coming years. Yeah, then I would just so uh, we are so we're selected for the NIH uh, MedTech Blueprint Seedling Program, which is an inaugural program this year. So we're one of the few companies selected there to um, sort of ready ourselves um, for participation in the full program, and then. We are also part of the Evo Nexus, which is an incubator in Southern California, a very well-respected one that has a lot of special expertise in medical devices. And we have a lot of great mentors from there. And uh, yeah, we've also been uh, beneficiaries of, uh, of a lot of generosity and charity from mentors like Randy Warnett, who has a Maxwell Biomedical and Arca Medical in San Diego, and um, also from Gary Duckweiler at uh, the Division of Intro Neuroradiology at UCLA and Naoki Kaneko, who has a lab at UCLA, been very generous with his time and resources. So we've had a lot of uh, different things in the pipeline that are working well and people helping us. And and I think that uh, we're sort of on our way to really get this thing going. Yeah, thank you. And as we're ending our podcast, is there anything you would like to tell our listeners to share, to encourage, anything you want to say? Yeah, I think I've said a lot of it already, but to sum it up, dream big, set a goal, be resilient, be honest with yourself, make people your mentors that really are what you want to be um, and that allow you to understand who it is that they are, because that's what leads to aspiration. I think um, having aspirational mentors is essential to maintaining your motivation. And I would say, learn to be effective with your time, but also don't be afraid to have a moment of silence and collect your thoughts. So it's just a lot of different little pockets of things that you need to practice, but um, you got this. <laughs> Thank you so much for all this encouragement, wisdom, all this uh, amazing information about true innovations that are coming. Uh, and of course, all possible success to you, your company and your family as well. Thank you. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, thank you for joining us on this incredible journey into the entrepreneurial world of neuroscience and neurotechnologies. I hope you've been inspired by the stories of those who are turning groundbreaking ideas into impactful realities. If you are looking for more guidance on succeeding in your careers, book a free consultation with me, your podcast host, Dr. K, at the Institute of Neuro Approaches. So, what are you waiting for? Let's navigate the path to success in the world of neuro careers and make the impossible possible together.